Uh, I have a few uh, comments and some questions I'd like to uh, to get into. Um, just going down the, the the list of you know some of it was extensive. I don't want to say accusations, and I find myself in this this situation of both agreeing and disagreeing with uh, a lot of the comments that you have at the same time. Uh, the the drop off in in uh, the the revenue in the hunters 33 uh, percent, which is a norm across the country not just in Pennsylvania. And I think we addressed the fact that hunting is, is competing with sports and other issues amongst our youth, and it certainly isn't the lack of deer that is the only cause of the downturn uh, in the number of hunting licenses, be, licenses being sold in Pennsylvania uh, as a whole. Um, the, the idea when it says for a, to the purpose of your, the bills is to prevent a merger, a merger of the Game Commission and the Fish Commission? Correct. Um, you can report back to your membership you've succeeded in that. There will be no merger coming past the Pennsylvania Senate's uh, Game and Fish Committees at any time in the near future. So I don't see what any legislation we would have to stand in and prevent it. And when you, when you actually say, hey, it's our duty to oversee, to, to have this oversight in this legislative process, understand the political process that it is. You're asking us both to stay out and get involved. Stay out of the political process. Don't let the governor have his say or have the governor consulted in this situation. Uh, don't have uh, an appointed member in comparing an appointed uh, eight-year term to an elected office. It's two different things. We elect the governor. The governor of Pennsylvania is, is charged through the democratic process with all the policies of the state, not the deer policy, but the environmental policy, the energy policy, the agriculture, every policy, and he puts in place his proposal, his people. We then have an oversight and a duty to confirm those people. And that is the, the, the checks and balances, never to actually micromanage. And as your comment says, don't micromanage. So you don't want us to micromanage, but you want us, if, the game, if we disagree with the Game Commission, let me finish, if we disagree with the Game Commission, you want us to step in there and strip away their ability to game or, or govern for eight years at a time, that you want a, a more, uh, more flexible uh, uh, ability to change the Game Commission. So under that scenario, if we don't like what the Game Commission is doing, we will be micromanaging by replacing them every four years as opposed to allowing the policy of the governor and policy that, that is put in place to, to ride itself out. So I'm kind of in a conflict here, but I don't understand it. And I'm going to give you all a chance to please explain to me how a, ter a quicker turnover of the Game Commission and the threat of legislative intervention isn't micromanaging the Game Commission. Uh, can I, can I, uh, let me take it back a couple of notches here because I, I did some, some constitutional investigation about the, this whole process. Um, generally speaking, most states, and, and is this state for sure, uh, concedes to the governor to appoint commissioners. This is, this is general practice in this state and across the country on the premise that the governor um, is the chief executive officer and he's in charge of spending the people's money. It always comes back to the money. So consequently, when you're talking about, you know, DEP or PennDOT or so and, and the liquor board and so forth, this is the, this is the people's money. He's, he's, he's the man. He was elected and so forth. But alas, when it comes to hunters, they're, they're, we're not talking about the people's money anymore. We're talking about, uh, in general, we're talking about a specialized tax over a group of specialized people. This, this, is, this is quite a bit different than, than speaking of all the people and all the tax money. Once again, the Game Commission is not utilizing any, any general tax dollars. So what I'm saying to you is that when this was conceived in the process of a governor appointing commissioners, including fish and game commissioners, um, I don't think a great deal of thought was put into it, legal thought or constitutional thought. It is a little isolated, separate situation from the state in general. It's not general tax dollars, and, it's a, and these commissioners are not representing the public in general. These commissioners are representing sportsmen. So I say that because we can, we can live with the governor doing the final appointment, but we'd like to see after 100 years of solely being the financiers of the Game Commission and the Fish Commission for 100, and the number, the total cumulative number is in the billions, billions. We really have no say. We really, sportsmen do not, and we'll find that out. We'll, well, I'll prove that fact in the next couple of weeks because one of the people that Unified wants as commissioner has already been eliminated as a, as a commissioner consideration. So in the coming weeks, that will unfold and prove my point that sportsmen have no say, yet we are the sole financial source of revenue for 100 years. In so the if I can get this point, because it is a separate financial 
stream of money coming only from hunters. Only hunters should have say in the spending of this money. Now, I will contend that that is not what the Game Commission is charged with. The Game Commission is charged with the all of all 8 million Pennsylvanians, the wildlife management of all the habitat, all the, the game and, and small game and large game of Pennsylvania. And by doing it, we are allowing the Game Commission to issue, to fund this by the government, allowing them to issue licenses to fund that operation. And it is exactly the same as the Pennsylvania Liquor Commission, who doesn't use any general money to fund their operation. Matter of fact, they give us about three, $350 million a year. So you're to say that because only the drinkers fund the game, the Liquor Commission, that only drinkers in Pennsylvania should have a say of what kind of beer goes into Pennsylvania? I mean, this is, oh, you're no, saying, no, no, you're, no, 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 this no. is a real, real, real tough thing that you, you the, no. the sportsmen have to understand that, that it's Pennsylvania's obligation, the governor's obligation to manage the wildlife. How they fund that and how they choose to fund that has no bearing on their final mission that they are responsible and we as the legislative oversight are responsible. So farmers, hunters, Everybody, all 8 million Pennsylvanians, have a say in what the policy should be by the Pennsylvania Game Commission, not just the hunters because they're the ones providing the money for it. Well, that, that's, that's the, that, I think you just framed the current argument by the Game Commission and some groups for the Game Commission to be funded by general tax dollars. And what I was saying, you, I think you misunderstand it a, li a little bit, is that they're, they, they are 469 species, and, and, and in theory, you're going to manage wildlife for all the people. Yes, that's all those things are true. However, they only have one funding source, only one funding source, and that's the sportsman. And we have the least to say. And what the argument I was making is that our say, our input on how things could be done or should be done, do need to be strengthened. We need to be part of the process of, of, of selecting commissioners. And if we have a commissioner, you know, whether it be for four years or eight years, and that commissioner turns out to be an anti-hunting commissioner, anti-gun commissioner, we need to have some rights in the process to prevent that from happening. And if that does happen, of course, we would like to have the rights to expose that and remove that person because that would be contrary to our best interest which is the funding revenue for the Game Commission, um, you know, to start. That we come full circle again. We're the guys supplying all the revenue, and we'd like to have some input in that so we can protect that funding stream so our, our ranks do not diminish, so that the industry is not destroyed. We've got to be part of that process. Now, the four-year terms, the four-year terms is, is very fair, very reasonable. You serve four years, uh, Senator. The President serves four years. The Governor serves four years. All we're saying is that... I would take an eight-year term if you want. <laughs> I'm sure you would. <laughs> and we're going to make sure no one else on the commission gets an eight-year term. But what we're, what we're saying is that certainly if that person does a, a, a fair and objective job after a four-year review or a three-year review, my God, the sportsmen and the general public and the Autobahn and the rest of us, we're all, we're all intelligent people. But we'd be able to review that and give that person our, our seal of approval and your approval to say this person's a good person. Let's let's do another four years. However, if that person is a whack job or if that person has not conducted themselves in the proper vein, if that person has made incoherent, you know, ridiculous decisions over the four years, once again, as the sole financiers of that game commission, we should have rights to say this person does not deserve and, and another four And I personally year. believe those, those rights are there through your elected officials, um, which is why we have the oversight and, and confirmation that well, that's currently we come happening. To you, though. That's, and at this point, we, I think we've seen uh, some testimony from the senators here asking for some changes, asking for some uh, uh, movement in the WMUs, and I've seen the game commission respond uh, over the last few years, um, probably not as dramatically as, as, as you all would like to see. Uh, they have responded in other areas of the state. So I guess if I went back to now the big issue, we're, we're on deer management, and the, the assertion here is that there are not enough deer in Pennsylvania. Now, are you saying in Pennsylvania or are you saying in specific areas of Pennsylvania? Well, we could look at the flyovers, and they, they did about 600,000 acres of flyovers, and deer densities were very, very low. Uh, per DCNR's own words, there's vast areas in Pennsylvania that have absolutely no deer whatsoever. We have our two special reg areas that, that you know, because of blocked land and, and posted land, do not get enough hunting pressure. We're now seeing the evolution of sharpshooters and, you know, tremendous amounts of money being spent to clean those deer out of there. Um, I, I could make the case that the deer management program has been a total and complete failure 
And, and I say that without sarcasm, because you look back over seven, eight years, we failed to remove the deer from the special reg areas where they were a nuisance and a problem, and in the areas where we needed deer as a recreational product, as a, as a biological asset to our forest, you know, as, a, as, a, as an economic product for our small communities, we killed too many. Now, you know, I don't want to sound critical, but <laughs> where you, where you should have some, you have none, and where you, you don't you want any, you have too many. I could make the argument that the program has been a dismal failure. So it, you are supportive of the changes to diminish the herds in some places of Pennsylvania? Well, if you take the 22 deer management zones, okay, once again, I've done a lot of interviews. We could go up to look at New York with 169 zones. I mean, we can go over to Wisconsin and we can look at 139 WMUs. We can look at other states. I'm just worried about Pennsylvania here. Of the, right. So well, there are so some WMUs in Pennsylvania that need the herd diminished. In the special reg areas, yes. Special reg I'm sure you And then there are other areas that are. The deer that, that season, you, the doses should enough be closed. Deer. It should and, be close. And you and you're all sportsmen here. You've all hunted. Um, you hunt in these areas that are yes. diminished. Yes. We don't find any sign. Senator, you go in the woods. We're all experienced people. We know you. You don't find any sign. You don't find any tracks. You don't find any rubs. You don't find any activity. It's, it's a dead zone. The deer are just not there. So okay. as sportsmen, this last hunting season, you were unable to bag a deer in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Wait, did well, you get a deer in Pennsylvania? I, I got a deer in Pennsylvania, but I'm special. That's different. You know what I mean? How long did it take you to get that deer? Fifteen minutes, but you know, it's okay. No. So you got a deer on the first 15 minutes of hunting season hour in Pennsylvania. Minutes. An hour and 15 no, minutes. And Greg shot a deer. We're good hunters. We're good hunters. And we, there will be hunters that will kill deer if there were 25,000 deer left in this state. There will be hunters that will, that will always kill deer. But you look at the industry. You look at 700, 800,000 hunters. You look at it as an economic product. You look at it as a success ratio. What does it take to keep the industry going and its economic impacts? It's a much more complex situation whether, you know, Steve, Jim, or Greg got a deer. You know, that it's, it's far more complex than that. And, and I would agree, and I think you saw the entire uh, uh, Senate committee here say that we need to continue to make changes. And I wouldn't want to go back eight years. I want to go back to the current administration and the changes that really started happening over the last three, four years. Uh, since Carl got here, and the the fact that there there have been movement by the game commission in response to pressure both by sportsmen groups and legislators to say we need to do something a little bit differently than we have done before, and that response has been tremendous in my opinion, and I might not have solved the entire problem over the last three years, but it certainly was much more of a movement than if I went back eight years and said, hey, I got a deer problem in in Pennsylvania over here, and basically I got a who cares? I, I, I agree that that was the way it was. But that is not what I'm looking at today with the Game Commission uh, in, in Pennsylvania. It's been a much – would you agree that it has been changed, the attitude has changed, more listening, more willingness to change I, I, over the last think, few years? I think, in all honesty, we, we have now a tail-wagging-the-dog uh, scenario. And, and what I mean is if you've observed the Game Commission over the last 10, 15 years, the Game Commission, in theory, the agency, were the experts. And they would make the recommendations and they would go to the, go to the commissioners and, and, you know, certain intervals during the course of the year and say, here's our recommendation, here's what we'd like to do, and here are, here are our proposals. And in most cases, those, uh, as, as years ago, those, uh, recommendations were accepted. In the last eight years or so, uh, in this latest bunch or group of, of commissioners, with a few exceptions, uh, we've seen the agency go to the commissioners and say, well, here's what we'd like to do. We'd like to take some pressure off the deer herd. We are concerned now. We would like to see, and we have seen the commissioners say, no, we're not going to do that. Well, no, we, they have said yes. No, they have no, made no, the no, no, no. Well, you have to, you know, we, we're talking about a number of specific individuals. We're talking about the overall influence. We're talking about the, the mantra of the, of, of the board of commissioners. It, it, it has been a, a testing, difficult situation. And, and I know, you know, and I'm, I'm trying not to reveal too much, but there, there's been disagreements between the agency and the Board of Commissioners that really prompted, that really prompted the request for four-year terms. That really was, that was really the origin of it. Because if we, if we now have, if we put commissioners in for so long and let a policy get established for so long that the commissioners now are not accepting the, the uh, recommendations of the agency, instead they are creating new recommendations themselves or creating new policy themselves, well now the system 
is convoluted. Now the system is flipped upside down. Now the tail is wagging the dog. And this, this was part of the impetus behind saying it might be time to, to change those bodies over a little bit more frequently, get some, some new thought and, and, and so forth. We don't want to see commissioners threatening the jobs of our, of our agency employees or we don't want the governor interfering and so forth. And many of these things can be resolved with this four-year term for the, for the, for the uh, base of our country. I see the point. It's a, you think it's a more of a shake-up, but I still think it would be more of a political involvement of micromanaging also. So understand that there is a, a balance in that. Can I come up to it with another issue? There was a, a, one of your points, the constitutional rights of the citizens um, are not being protected on Title IV. You meaning with regards to hunting on the private property and being sued when that incident happened in, in Lehigh? It's number six uh, on your, your issues. I don't understand the, that there's a constitutional violation or, or, or not being – the Constitution not protecting adequate protection for wildlife but contains no language that grants adequate protection to people and their property. Senator, I'd like to address that question. <clears throat> this issue has arisen over the shooting of elk for property damage in north central Pennsylvania. There, there were about four cases of a landowner who shot elk for damaging his crops. It went to court and they were found innocent. Here recently, the Art Gavlock case, in which Art Gavlock shot and killed an elk for damaging his apple tree in his yard. He, he was cited for poaching. Taken to court, magistrate's court, found guilty. He's appealed it. He was found guilty. He's going up again in, in, in this aspect, in this legal, legal trial. But the fact of the matter is that there's no law in place that to protect the landowner from the damage of wildlife damaging their property. There is no law in place. If you have a bear coming at you, and he's 15 feet away. When are you? When do you have permission to shoot him to protect yourself? A constitutional right in the in the in Title 34, five feet. You know, this this is something that should be clarified both for the protection of a personal personal right and protection of people's property. So what would end up happening is it would fall under a Title 18 offense. So if you're, you would defend yourself in the court saying you, your life was threatened and the court were thrown out. So I, I would say in order, under those anecdotal situations, was that apple tree, uh, uh, was, was, was he calling the moose over? <laughs> I mean, that, I mean the, the elk over. I mean, it, there's a, probably a, a something that was happening in there and you let the court system decide. But I think that there was is adequate, and we've taken great strides to make sure that there's ad adequate protection under Title IV for the hunters in Pennsylvania. We just changed that last year after the case of the, the, the shooting up in Lehigh Valley. Uh, so if there are further issues that, that are sitting there where people are actually losing their property because uh, allowing uh, something to happen on the hunting ground, we would want to con continue to ensure that. Um, and I don't think that that issue, that elk issue or being cited for poaching is, is a constitutional, uh, you know, threatening. You're, you're not losing your property if you get fined for poaching. Um, I don't know what Carl's confiscating properties yet. Maybe they, that's a good way to fund the Gabe Commission, I guess, if uh, we could constantly. Uh, uh, one, there was another thing. There's, uh, Steve, you were a former commissioner, game commissioner? For eight and a half years, uh, District 6, which encompasses 11 counties in uh, Lancaster, York, Dauphin, uh, that area. And your term expired? My after, term expired uh, December 7th of 06. And the vacant, we aren't able to get this vacancy, I understand it. Now, when you were there for that time period, what was, you, you were part of the, the situation there. We, were the votes split? Were there a lot of the conversations and, and how to usually, manage it? I was usually the part that was the one. It was usually seven to one or six to one, and I was usually the one. Once in a while I had some company, there was two of us vote the opposite way, but. Well, and I guess that goes to my point that the game commission couldn't possibly be stacked all the time if you got on it and were a descending vote. So a governor, and it got through the process that you were able to put representative of sportsmen on the game commission, you had the, the, the votes were there, whether or not the votes were on your favor or not, and, it, and it's done by region, and obviously there are different deer problems around different parts of the state, so my game commissioner <laughs> is going to have a different 
take than you would from your area on, this, on the, the deer herd. Um, but that's what Pennsylvania and the legislature does. We come together as a group and the majority wins. It's democracy of what we think is the best course of action. So to the current process would seem to work under that situation. Well, Senator, if I could, I could add some detail here for a moment. Uh, if we take a look at the state of Nevada, they have eight commissioners too. Four commissioners are hunters. Four commissioners must be hunters and represent the hunter's point of view. The other four commissioners are the ranching community, the farming community, the environmental community, and, and so forth. So they have this balance, this, this four to four balance. They, 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 they set up this system that, that hunters are going, are, are going to speak of the economic impacts, the recreational, the social, you know, and, and so forth. They're going to speak. That's going to be their key issue. Are there any non-hunters on the Game Commission board? On, no, no, but well, we got we got a whole board of hunters. Well, now check that. Um, maybe they've previously hunted at one time. I can't say for sure if they're all current hunters. They may have all hunted they get at one free time, licenses now, one so. time or another. Well, now you they know, don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, somebody used to be a Democrat. Now they're a Republican. I mean, these things change. These things happen. But um, this is a common problem. As you bring these uh, commission commissioners in one at a time, they're they're very often. The board, the, the group can be skewed in one deck direction or another because they're being brought in one at a time and they're being selected for a, a, a certain area. Other states have overcome that problem by, by declaring, well, yes, we're going to have a forester on the board. We're going to have a farmer on the board. We're going to have an anti-hunter on the board and, and so forth. But well, So it, now but, we're saying we don't want, nine, is there seven members of the board? Eight. eight. We don't want eight hunters. You want to put on farmers and other... Oh, I just used an example of, of you mentioned Steve and Steve's situation. I just used an example of common problems when you bring commissioners on one at a time, the board can be skewed, and how other states have overcome that. Senator, one thing uh, I would add to that, uh, it, it wasn't always a problem of being the deck stacked and... Uh, and it wasn't the present administration that even started stacking the deck. It, the deck was started to be stacked during the Ridge administration, and it just uh, got worse uh, in the present administration. Uh, when I went on board, I wasn't uh, scrutinized by the uh, secretary of DCNR. I wasn't uh, scrutinized by the governor's office uh, about uh, what positions I was taking. Uh, Basically, I, I was just put there because they thought I had a, a, some in-depth knowledge, uh, being uh, from a farming community, plus, plus being uh, from political uh, arena, be it the, the lowest form of politics in Pennsylvania. But and then it, uh, I had to find Senator uh, Noah Wanger that uh, w was supporting me. So I, I wasn't really scrutinized in that way. I don't want you to think it was a walk in the park. It took a long time to get confirmed. But I don't think I was put there, and, and I definitely wasn't told this is the way you will vote. No, that's what I would, would anticipate that the system is working at. But they, that, you put people that you think they're going to do the best job, you, and they're trying to look out for the total balance of Pennsylvania. Um, and I understand that you would like to have a, a review more often, and maybe that's not a bad thing. Uh, but uh, that is more of a political involvement than once we get down that path. Well, um, I would love to continue and chat this the entire day, but we're just told we we're a convening session uh, in five minutes. So we're going to have to end the, the hearing. And I think that this will not be the last uh, word of this. We'll, we'll continue to, to have this discussion throughout. And I do thank you all for taking the time to come out here to Harrisburg to have this discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.